Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. My name is Khalil Doheny, and I'm Director of Content Marketing at Digital Niche Agency. Today, we have Jim Martin. Uh, Jim, how are you doing today? Doing great. Thanks, everybody, for uh, signing up for the webinar and joining us. Appreciate it. Of course, of course. And while people are trickling in, do you want to just kind of just go into your background and really what we can expect from the webinar today? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to cover, uh, you know, I'll go over my background real quick, then I'll be covering our current products and then our po portfolio products that we're going to be launching and, and uh, that we have in the process of launch and things like that. So just a little bit about my background. I am from Kentucky. I'm a, a fifth generation moonshiner from Kentucky, and uh, I'm the first one in our family to be legal. So that's why the tagline of our company that's on our bottles here is notoriously good for not getting caught. So uh, we're completely legal now and doing everything in the up and up way. Uh, my family has been making whiskey since 1883. Uh, and I've been making whiskey since I was nine years old. That's how I got uh, started. It was a, it's a family business, obviously. And I grew up, you know, making whiskey. And then eight years ago, um, I went legal uh, and formed the Key West Trading Company, purveyors of fine whiskeys and spirits. When I moved down to Key West, Florida, uh, with the intention of uh, bringing our family heritage uh, of whiskey uh, to the southernmost uh, city in the United States. And that's where I came up with the Smuggler's Whiskey. And this is basically the moonshine recipe that has been aged and turned into a bourbon. So this is the southernmost bourbon in the continental United States. And um, it's it's lighter and kind of fruity. We use a special process to make it called Terrapure. Uh, so that way it can be mixed in tropical drinks when you're having a, a vacation down in Key West or you're in, a, in a tropical location. You can substitute this bourbon in any uh, rum drink. So instead of instead of doing a well rum or something at the bar down in Key West, an Irish Kevin's or somewhere, for example, you can say, give me a rum runner, but substitute the smuggler's whiskey for the well rum. And then you can drink a top quality product and still enjoy your your drink with a with an umbrella hanging out in it and, and uh, enjoy your vacation. Uh, so that, that's my background. Uh, like I said, I've been in this business, you know, my entire life on both sides of the fence. And uh, so it's in our blood, it's in our DNA, so to speak. And, um, you know, like I said, originally, this is the product that we came out with first. Um, and then after that, this was eight years ago. And then after that, we launched Temple Pence Revenge Rum. Uh, this is a, an amazing rum. Uh, if you just enjoy the taste of rum itself. Um, this is a, a great product. And then we launched the uh, vodka, which is the Wrecker Select vodka. I designed this vodka just to be super pure and whatever you mix it in, you only taste the mix. So it's uh, uh, 30 times distilled. And then we run it through an extra purification process, the Terra Pure process, which cleans it even more and reduces the congeners, the impurities in it by 70%. So it's almost impossible to make it any more pure than this this vodka. I want it to be where you don't really taste the vodka, you just taste the, the drink that you're mixing it into. And then that brought us into, um, Key West is a Hemingway town. Uh, Hemingway has his house here. He also has a house in Havana, Cuba. And um, my love for spirits and absinthe and history and all of those kind of things led me down the path of absinthe. So absinthe, and I just want to kind of talk about absinthe for a moment and um, the legalities of it and the, you know, what we can do, what we can't do. Absinthe was invented in 1792 in Switzerland by a coven of witches. It's a very famous story. The coven of witches was a very famous coven. There's been books written about them. They've been in movies. Uh, it's, it's a very well-known fact. They're the ones that came out with the original absinthe recipe and then later sold the recipe to uh, a doctor named Dr. Ordinaire. That was his actual real name, Dr. Ordinaire. And he was a, effectively a snake oil salesman. And uh, he was from, uh, spent a lot of time in France and kind of marketed in the French region. So between S Switzerland and France, and he was back and forth. The original version of it, and it's a tincture, it's an alcohol based, back then it was a medication, a tincture that was had botanicals in it. <clears throat> so in order to be an absinthe, it must contain grand wormwood, star anise, and fennel. And it has to be between 110 and 150 proof. So it's a high proof alcohol, botanical based. It must contain those three botanicals to be an absinthe. It gets its name from the grand wormwood, which is Artemisia absinthium. So if it doesn't have grand wormwood in it, it is not a real absinthe. So uh, 
our absinthe in particular, this is the green one, uh, the color doesn't matter as far as whether it's an absinthe or not. The original Swiss version version was a, a blanche. It had no color to it whatsoever, and it just typically has a red cross on it for, you know, it's a medical, medical use uh, product. When it migrated to France and Dr. Ordinaire took it over there, different regions of France had different botanicals that they would add to the absinthe for different healing properties and colorizations and different things. So this color, uh, I don't know if you can see that, it's a green color. That's the most popular one. It's the green fairy, uh, like in Moulin Rouge. There's uh, the green fairies in Moulin Rouge. Uh, the color comes from lemon balm and petite wormwood. This is 100% plant-based, all natural, made in an 1800s traditional style. No fake colors, no fake uh, stabilizers, no chemicals of any kind uh, added to it other than the ethanol, of course, of the alcohol itself uh, that, that you drink. Um, so this is just the most popular one, but the color itself doesn't matter. It's just, uh, uh, it can be clear, it can be red, green, purple, you know, it doesn't matter. Those are just, just different uh, things that are added to it. So the reason we call it Death in the Afternoon, our first product, is uh, Hemingway started drinking absinthe when he was a war correspondent in France. So this we recreated, it was very important to recreate the style of absinthe that Hemingway drank on this particular product. So it's a French vert. So this is a classic 1800 style French vert that Hemingway would have started drinking uh, when he was a war correspondent in France, albeit he was drinking it illegally. So uh, absinthe was um, banned in the United States in 1912, and it was banned from 1912 until 2007. Uh, the main reason it was banned, other than there was a bunch of political reasons going on, there was uh, the teetotalers and they were pushing towards prohibition and those kind of things uh, were happening. Uh, so they uh, just de deemed it a, a public health hazard because it contains thujone. So the thujone is the controversial part of absinthe that, you know, they didn't have laboratories to test products uh, back in the day and those kind of things. So um, that's kind of, um, they just made them take the thujone out, then it could no longer be an absinthe. And it was banned in every country in the world at one time, except for Spain. Spain was the only country that, that allowed it to be made legally uh, through, through the entire process. <clears throat> so fast forward till 2007. In 2007, now we have laboratories. They went back and tested bottles of absinthe from the 1800s. And what they found uh, was that the thujone was completely harmless. Uh, they proved in the laboratory that you could not, cons there's not enough thujone and absinthe to cause any sort of physical harm to a person to start with. The interesting thing that they did find was high concentrations of lead. So people were actually getting lead poisoning in the 1800s and early 1900s because the stills were made out of lead or there was parts of the still that were made out of lead and they were heating up the stills and then concentrating lead into the product. So the crazy stories about absinthe and the absinthe murders and, you know, families, you know, uh, being broken apart and stuff because of people drinking absinthe, uh, which, by the way, was also marketed along with opium dens. <laughs> so there was a bunch of stuff that was going on in the late 1800s. Uh, another big thing politically was in France in the late 1800s, uh, people drank more absinthe than wine. So the wine industry was also uh, politically, you know, trying to get absinthe banned. Uh, in France in the 1800s, a uh, happy hour was known as the green hour. So absinthe uh, houses and things like that were very, very common. And then people would, uh, you know, spend a lot of time drinking absinthe. It was a very social thing to do. And I'll show you guys here in a minute uh, the social aspects of absinthe. So. The biggest misnomers and the misconceptions that we get from absinthe is that absinthe in the U.S. now is not the same as it was in the 1800s. It is 100 percent as just like it was made in the 1800s. We import all the botanicals from France. I put an entire pallet of Grand Wormwood in every single batch of absinthe that we produce. Uh, all the botanicals that I put in the absinthe come from France, from the same original regions. It's top quality ingredients. There's nothing fake, no fake colors, no fake anything. And it contains as much thujone as if you bought a bottle in 1880 in France. So I just want to get that out of the way. It's, and it's 100% legal. It goes under the minimum allowable quantities of thujone, you know, in the product. And at the end of the day, what's going on with the thujone? Why is absinthe so different and what makes it such a unique um, uh, product and which is also a major part of our company, a major part of our expansion is based around our absinthe recipes and the way we're going to expand the company is through our line of absinthe that we, that we have. We have five approved recipes through the federal government. So the thujone itself, what it does is it has an opposite effect on the brain as the ethanol. 
So instead of getting drunk, it confuses the brain. So you don't get drunk from absinthe, you get a euphoric feeling. So it's, it's a euphoria. Um, so it's a completely different product. There's no other alcohol product like it in the world. It's its own category, it's its own thing. So that's why it was known as the drink of artists because artists and poets and writers, people like Edgar Allan Poe and of course Hemingway and Van Gogh, these guys could drink absinthe and then still do their craft because they have this euphoric feeling. They're not drunk. Um, it, it does things to the brain where, you know, colors are, are uh, more vibrant and things like that. So for an artist or someone like that. So that's why it's, it's commonly known as the drink of artists. And that's why, you know, we kind of you know, play on that with our branding and stuff. And, it's, uh, so, and then a death in the afternoon, which is our first product. Um, and let me show you real quick uh, before I get into that, the proper way to drink absinthe. Absinthe is a tincture uh, and you never drink absinthe straight. A lot of people have had bad experiences with the way absinthe tastes or, or whatever. They did a shot of it. It's not intended for someone to do a shot. So we have all the proper accoutrements. You don't have to have these specific things. We do sell them on our website and you can buy them, you know, different places on the internet. Um, it's served in this type of a glass here, which is known as a Pontarlier, designed for absinthe in the 1800s by the Pernod Company in France. The little bottom vessel of the glass here is uh, that holds 0.9 ounces. So when you pour the absinthe in there, it just fills up this little uh, ball in the bottom of the glass. That's 0.9 uh, uh, ounces of absinthe. And then we typically, if you want to be fancy, we'd set it on the little saucer, just like if you're in an absinthe house in, in France in the 1800s. These are reproduction uh, porcelain saucers. Each one has uh, what the cost in francs would be uh, for this particular drink of absinthe. So the bar, when you ordered an absinthe of a particular kind, they would fill up the little ball. They would serve it to you um, on the little saucer. And then you would take an absinthe spoon. And typically in the 1800s, this would be a personal item that you you know, would carry around with you, like the autographed pins. And these would be gifts that you give someone. It was a very popular thing to have. But then they would also have common ones that are at the absinthe bar itself. And then so it's just a slotted spoon. There's a thousand different variations of it. Sits on top of the glass like this. And then you would put a sugar cube on top of that. And the sugar itself is strictly for taste. So you drop a little sugar cube on top of it. And um, absinthe has uh, the star anise gives it a black licorice kind of a taste. That's you know, the overall you know taste of absinthe itself. The water dilution itself actually mellows that out substantially. That's why when you drink a shot of it, it's like drinking a shot of black licorice. So you know it's it's uh, there's also a chemical process that happens. So once you have your absinthe all set up like this in a proper setup, then we would use. If you're in a fancy absinthe house, you would use an absinthe fountain that serves four, three, four, five people, depending on the, the product. They make single serving ones for a person at home. And then you would open the little valve and slow drip like a leaky faucet, uh, cold water, ice cold water. This vessel holds ice cold water and it would drip over the sugar cube into the glass, creating the drink. And that process is called a la louche. And it actually changes colors. It, it actually goes from that kind of darker green color, plant looking color into like this opalescent, uh, almost mystical. That's where all the uh, dramatization comes from and the paintings and the movies and the, the songs and stuff that were created about absinthe. That's the green fairy, you know, she's getting out and then the, she takes over and starts running everything. So uh, when, you're, when you're adding the water to the drink, um, there's some little scallops on the glass. Different glasses are made different ways. Sometimes it's a line, sometimes it's a decoration of some sort. So there's no measuring needed. Once the water hits that point there, then you would just stir up the drink. And it's typically just drank at room temperature. You would sit and enjoy your, your louche and your absinthe around with your friends and then drink out of the glass. And that is a five to one mix of water to absinthe. So that's typically, no matter how you're drinking or what you're mixing it with, that's kind of the magic ratio. It's a five to one uh, water to sugar. And like I said, this process is called, it's called a la louche. Hemingway, on the other hand, was a diabetic, couldn't do the sugar cube, and uh, louched his absinthe with champagne, a really high-end French champagne. You can use any kind of bubbly product like that or sodas or different things. Um, absinthe with the old-fashioned root beer and a little bit of frenet is called a root of all evil. That's a good way when you make that kind of a drink. Um, the same thing, it's a five to one, slap a little mint, put it on top of it. That actually uh, gives you a more mellow product for those who just don't like to taste a black licorice. But at the end of the day, what you're trying to get to is absence effect on the body and the brain, which is a completely different uh, effect from any other alcohol would have on you. 
So anyway, down to that, a so our product, the Death in the Afternoon, which is our homage to Hemingway. Um, Death in the Afternoon is a book, obviously, that Hemingway wrote. And then his signature drink is the Death in the Afternoon, which is the absinthe and champagne. Um, so that was a published in a book, uh, uh, kind of a celebrity uh, recipe book called So Red is the Nose. He did a handwritten letter, submitted it in there. So it was five parts champagne to one part absinthe. And then he recommended in his writings that you drink five of them in rapid succession. And then if you drink a sixth one, it's called The Sun Also Rises, which is another book that, that Hemingway wrote. Um, anyway, so that when we launched that product a few years ago, uh, that really, um, you know, was kind of a catalyst for us and for our growth and for the future of the company. Um, our, so we now have currently have five approved recipes through the federal government. And that is our expansion is into these other products, uh, these other absence. The next one that's going to be coming out is our Voodoo Fairy, which is our New Orleans banner, which is the spirits of New Orleans. Uh, and our plan for the future is to expand in the New Orleans and be a specialist, a special distributor specializing in absinthe. And this one, um, I don't know if you can see that or not, is a lavender colored absinthe. It's uh, kind of purplish looking in the bottle. And then when you add the water to it, it gets the lavender look. Uh, the color for this comes from Indiana purple corn. So uh, excellent product. Keep in mind that the tastes are effectively the same. It's the, the star anise and the black licorice that's the overall effect. We do have hyssop in there so that when it's mellowed out in the drink and then you, you drink it, you get a little bit of minty uh, minty flavor on the back end. It's super mellow, super uh, easy to drink. Uh, the sugar, when we add that, it's just like the, the Mary Poppins, a spoonful of sugar makes the medicine go down. That's exactly what a tincture was back in the day. So you would, you would take the concentrate, add water to it, put a little sugar in there to make it good for the kids. And that, that's where that saying came from. Uh, the next product that'll be coming out after that is Red Devil, which is our absinthe that is colored with hibiscus. Uh, that one actually gets a little bit of an herbal uh, tea kind of a taste to it, different kind of a product that's red. Uh, we also have another product that um, it uses the original botanical load for Dr. Pepper. Dr. Pepper originally was a tincture, so that's why they have 10, 2, and 6 on the old bottles. I think they're starting to bring that back a little bit, was because you're supposed to drink Dr. Pepper at 10 a.m., 2 p.m., and 6 p.m. for health reasons. <laughs> so it was considered a health drink. Now it's just a soda, obviously, but we took the original botanical load for Dr. Pepper, and then we're going to call that product Dr. Ordinaire, and that will be actually we'll recommend loosing that product with Dr. Pepper and the product itself tastes like tastes like the Dr. Pepper. It's inspired by it. Right. So it's not uh, it's not the current recipe that they're using was the original botanical load from back back then. Uh, another product that is already approved and ready to go is our Skippy's Mistake Tropical Gin. That's one of our Kiwis Trading Company products. Uh, it's already we've already made it. It's uh, just waiting on the final label approval to come back and we'll be getting that into the bottle. And getting that out, it's made from Florida citrus, uh, very tropical, you know, tasting gin. So obviously, being on the uh, out on the coast and down the islands, you know, we want want to create that tropical product. Uh, so that's you know, all, in addition to having you know our 750 milliliter bottles of our products, we also have uh, our 375 milliliter, which is you know, two of these make a 750, and then we have the little 50 mil uh, airplane bottles in our products as well. And we're going to come out with the absinthe products in particular, a 200 milliliter bottle. Uh, that's kind of just the, the trend right now uh, as far as absinthe is concerned and things like that. I um, want to talk a little bit about um, uh, kind of our expansion and some of the things that, with, that we've been doing, you know, with the company in general. We have now launched in Miami, uh, up in Miami. Our branding up there is the Miami Smuggler Company, uh, keeping with the same theme and playing off of the 1980s, you know, uh, cocaine cowboys and the smugglers and all the crazy stuff that built Miami. Uh, we've got a little darker whiskey that's a little more aged uh, that will be coming out called the uh, the, the Cartel Select um, bourbon whiskey that'll be under that um, umbrella. And then we've got a really nice aged rum uh, that we're working on now, uh, finalizing the, the, the blend and stuff of that rum to, that'll be part of that, that product line as well. Um, we have a website called absinthedevil.com all of our absinthe products and all uh, accoutrements and everything absinthe related, our festival, our absinthe houses, all of that kind of stuff will, instead of having different websites for all those, it all will land on absinthedevil.com. 
So we've, we've partnered with a, uh, it's actually live right now. You can go check out absentdevil.com. Doesn't have the store and stuff attached to it. So we, we partnered with a, uh, a pretty uh, popular um, a web company in the United States. And they're going to build that website out for us and optimize it and get the store built on there where you can buy the glasses and the saucers and the different kinds of uh, uh, absinthe fountains and the little individual ones that are called uh, balanciers, you know, that you can have for your house or to travel with your, any of those kind of things, little travel kits, uh, shirts and branding, you know, hats, shirts, you know, all the, all the swag stuff, all that will just live on absinthedevil.com. And that's what we'll market nationally and internationally as our, as our uh, repository for all things absinthe. One of the things that lives on there is, is our absinthe festival. Uh, which is called the Green Fairy Fest. We were the first one in the United States to have an absinthe festival, just like they have Whiskey Fest and Rum Fest and all the other different festivals. We were the pioneers in that, and we created um, uh, the Green Fairy Fest. Uh, uh, very popular. It happens during race week in Key West, and this year will be our third year doing that. And I don't know of any other absinthe festival in the United States. Like, don't, don't hold me to that. I just don't know of any. I haven't seen any advertisements for it, but we were first. Um, so... That information uh, lives on absentdevil.com as well. So you can check that out, maybe be a part of it, make some make a trip down. Um, obviously our expansion to New Orleans is a, a big thing for us uh, for our future is um, that is the number one city in the United States for absinthe. It's a you know French town, has all the French connections and those kind of things. So uh, we don't just sell product. So we don't just sell the absinthe themselves. We have an entire program that goes along with it, just like we operate in Key West and we'll be doing it in Miami and then moving it to New Orleans. We provide the products, we provide the recipes, we provide the all the accoutrements, the fountains, the saucers, the spoons. We provide all that to the retail location and then we train their staff on absinthe history, proper absinthe service, ways to mix absinthe. You know, all of those kind of things uh, is all a package thing. And then we maintain the fountains every month or every two months we go around and swap the fountains out and clean them and bring fresh fountains and you know do all that stuff so the, the bar itself the retail location you know doesn't have to uh, build a program around it we already have the program in place so it kind of puts us out in front of the competition nobody else is doing that that we know of we've been all over new orleans and talked to them uh, all the you know different retail locations and uh, no one half the people there don't even know how to properly do it or even what the history is so we were really kind of out in front, you know, as far as that's concerned from a market standpoint. <clears throat> we are sitting right now in the Absinthe House in Key West. Uh, the Absinthe House is now a little over two years old. Um, there's ye old Absinthe House in New Orleans. And then ours is Absinthe House, which is built and patterned after like a French style Absinthe House from the 1800s. <clears throat> a bunch of antiques. We're in Key West with a lot of nautical antiques and things like that here. It's just a beautiful experience where you can come in a French marble table and have your absinthe fountain and sit around listening to some jazz or some blues and, and you know, sample uh, the absinthe products themselves. Uh, we operate the one here in Key West as a um, uh, event center. So it's open for rental for events and things like that. So it's not a bar that just is open certain hours or whatever. We have events, we have absinthe events and we do different things. Uh, talk history for a minute. I do want to bring up the fact that uh, as we talked about Hemingway, and Hemingway never drank absinthe legally. We have the Hemingway house in Key West and the, he had a, a house in Havana, Cuba. Um, and that the Pilar, the boat that the rum is named after, you know, down here in Key West, all that is over in Cuba, his house in Cuba. Um, uh, during the Conquer Republic Independence celebration, uh, four years ago, we had an absinthe event at the Hemingway house where we had a hundred people, four people per table, five course meal with an absinthe fountain on every table. And then uh, we had the DJ was playing 1930s and 1940s music on the lawn of the Hemingway house. If you can imagine how beautiful that was, it's a beautiful afternoon. And then when you walked in the gate uh, to wait to get seated at your white tablecloth table, you would get a death in the afternoon cocktail handed to you. So while you were waiting, you could enjoy a death in the afternoon. Then you'd be escorted out, set at your table. And, kind of, and it was a beautiful event. It was 100% attended, 100% sold out. We've done several of those type of events. But anyway, the point that I want to make is that that was the we made history because that was the first time absinthe had been consumed on the Hemingway property legally. Hemingway never got to enjoy absinthe legally at his own house. So we, we set that um, that uh, goal for ourselves and we you know made history, which can only be done the one time. And the whole premise behind it was you could sit on Hemingway's lawn and enjoy absinthe as he would listen to the kind of music that he would listen to. 
and enjoy the type of food that he would eat. We had bison steak, you know, for the for the main course. And then fast forward to, uh, I think, three weeks ago now, we took a group of 18 people on one of our trips to Havana, Cuba. We went over there and we went to the, the Hemingway house in Havana and we set up an absinthe tasting right in front of the Pilar boat, right on the Hemingway estate and broke another or create another historical event where we enjoyed absinthe legally at the Hemingway estate in Havana, Cuba uh, for the first time ever. So he never got to enjoy absinthe there either when he was uh, when he was alive. Absinthe was made illegal when he was a teenager uh, living in Chicago. So he, he never got to enjoy, except for when he went to Spain, he did get to drink absinthe legally. Only place in the world he got to drink it legally was in Spain. Um, so, you know, with our products, we try to, we, we love the history. We love staying true to the history. We love having the stories. All of our products are, are made with the, the best possible ingredients. We spend a lot of time developing the recipes and making sure that our products are top quality. We don't use any artificial colors, any artificial stabilizers, any added chemicals. We make it as pure, clean, uh, organic. And anytime we have the opportunity to buy organic, we'll buy organic. Um, this, all of our products are just, just we demand that they, they meet a certain you know, quality level. We're not going to cut any corners or if we can't figure out what that purple is supposed to be, we're not going to add a purple coloring to it like, like other people do. Not that there's not good products. I don't want to say that. Um, anyway, but that's important to know is that um, we, we stick with, uh, that's why this absinthe, we spent a little over a year uh, working with Alan Bishop uh, from Spirits of French Lick to come up with the exact proper style of French vert that Hemingway would have drank uh, when he was a war correspondent in France. I insisted that the color was right, that it tasted right, that the louche was proper, that everything about the product was 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 period correct. And same thing with the other products that we come up with. We only release it uh, when we when we know that we've got it down to a good product. Um, let's see. So uh, also some uh, our you know growth uh, in the spirits industry is all about distribution, right? So we're in Key West, which is a very small market, and we've we've dominated the market here. We've got most every account that we could possibly have here. We've established the brand, we've built the product portfolio. So the natural expansion is into you know, Miami was the obvious, that's our backyard. A lot of people from Miami come to Key West on the weekends. Everybody there you know, knows where Key West is and is familiar with the, with, uh, with the branding. So we've just launched there in January. We've got an office downtown on Flagler Street and we're starting our, our distribution there as a, we are a licensed wholesale distributor in, in Florida. Uh, we just partnered yesterday with Liquor Split. Liquor Split is an app. Um, they're kind of filling the market where Drizzly, I don't know if anybody's heard, but Drizzly is going out of business. They got bought out by Uber Eats. And so Liquor Split works off the same kind of platform. They use Uber Eats and, and um, uh, those, those delivery services to deliver alcohol from local liquor stores uh, directly to, to your house just through, through the Uber Eats. Uh, but it goes through, it's called Liquor Split. Um, and so we just partnered with them yesterday. We'll be launching liquor delivery in Key West later this month. And then starting next month, and we will be covering uh, Miami, Fort Lauderdale and kind of, you know, Miami-Dade County and moving around from there. And then, you know, moving and expanding with those guys from the liquor delivery side as we can scale that up. Uh, then obviously New Orleans will be the next one for, for liquor split. They're already all over the United States and they've already got this covered. Just now we have to, we'll be building out our distribution side to supply those liquor stores and cover those, the, the territories that make sense as we grow. Uh, we're also like when you go on our website at keywesttradeco.com and you click buy now, we're sold online through the cash cartel that we've been selling with those guys for eight years now. They're, if not the largest, one of the largest online suppliers of alcohol in the United States that deliver directly to your house or our customers, except for the 17 control states, have always been able to go to our website or Cast Cartel, order our products, get it shipped directly to your house in the states that it's legal to do that. Like I said, there's 17 states and you know who you are uh, where you can't get that delivered. The control states where the, the government runs the liquor stores. Um, uh, other expansions, we had a, a a company reach out to us, a distributor in that's in Los Angeles area that distributes in Southern California. And we're in the process of finalizing our deal with them. They've already put out all the flyers and stuff to their to their suppliers on the retail side, or their, uh, I'm sorry, their retailers. And uh, so that's already in the work for some Southern California distribution. Kind of my, my point of that is, is that we spent a lot of boots on the ground time these last eight years, building the brand, perfecting the process, getting the portfolio ready so that now we're ready to do this expansion into these other markets and service our, our clients. 
even though I'm in Key West and, you know, we've only been three, three hours away from Miami, we were not set up, you know, we're not going to take on clients and retailers that we can't service properly. So that's why it's taken this long to, to get to the point to where now we can set up operations to supply those customers and give the customer support and the customer service. That's a super important part of our business model. Uh, we need to make sure that we can service, service that properly and that the, we can handle the growth. And as we grow, uh, we can do the right, do the right job. We don't want to run out of product or have a, a retailer that can't get the product. So that, that's definitely what we're trying to avoid. And that's the reason it's taken us eight years to get to this point. Now, what we can see from this point from, and while we're bringing on investors, we've done everything so far debt-free, no partners, no anything, uh, 100% owner of the company. I do deliveries, I do the compliance, I do the formulations, I do all, you know, the, the, the do, you know, wear all the hats, right? Um, so now we're at a point to where uh, moving, just simply moving into the Miami area, we're going from 36,000 people and some tourism to, you know, three and a half million people <laughs> and from eight liquor stores to like 3,500 liquor stores. So you can see the difference in the scalability and what we're up against now, now we're into exponential growth. And that was the main reason that, that you know, I decided to get on the platform and, and bring on investments. Uh, we need to raise this capital to now just fuel the, uh, the, the system that we've already put in place. Uh, we're not, as we bring in money and capital and do, do capital raise, uh, it's not like we're gonna sit back and go, okay, now that we have the money, what are we gonna do with it? We already know exactly where everything's gonna go and what we're gonna do as the money comes in. That's why as soon as money started coming in, we got Miami launched and we're into that market and we're doing all the things that we need to do to get it going. We're not sitting around thinking about what needs to be done. Um, so let's see if I've covered everything here. Um, yeah, I think that's, uh, there's another video, our, our YouTube channel uh, has a bunch of videos on there. We post videos all the time. Of course, our Facebook, Instagram page, we're constantly posting stuff, new locations, new ways to pick up the product, you know, all the, you know, social media obviously is what, what drives things more than anything. All of the groups, Facebook groups, those kind of things. So if you follow us, you know, follow us on all those different, uh, that's the, the best way to get updated on things, you know, for sure. I want to take a moment to sincerely thank everyone who's tuned in and even thought about uh, investing into our a little small company here as we grow and we appreciate you guys jumping on board with us any consideration at all you know we sincerely appreciate it even if you decide that you're not investing and you just buy a bottle that means as much to us as well appreciate any support you can get our company was built organically on every single person who supports us we have customers from all the way back at the beginning who have the first bottle they bought and then we had special editions and they bought those and when irma hit we made a special edition case for irma bottles you know made out of uh, hurricane debris <laughs> people still have those products and stuff so we've got uh, uh, i can't thank uh, people enough because we can't get to the where we're going without the people who have supported us all along the way and you know we appreciate 100 percent of everything you guys do i'm always available anytime uh personally jim at keywestradeco.com you can always reach out to me with questions or you got an issue with something or you got an idea or you want to help out in some way or we get calls all the time, people saying, hey, I'm Joe from Connecticut and I've got a friend that owns a bar down the street and let's we'll see if we can get your product in there, you know? So even those kind of things, you know, mean a lot to us. So um, I guess I'll turn this back over to the moderator and see if he's got some questions loaded up for us. We'll jump into a Q&A session and yeah. be happy to uh, answer any any questions. I know there's a lot of information to take in. I appreciate the, <laughs> the time. Yeah, no, awesome, Jim. That was a, a great verbal presentation of Key West and you know, it got me a lot, you know, intrigued with absinthe. And I'm gonna, I was just looking at your website. I might go ahead and buy a bottle and have it shipped over here. Um, but yeah, we're going to, you know, have some time right now for some Q&A. And just wanted to reiterate, you know, there are going to be some questions that we unfortunately can't give answers to due to SEC guidelines. So that's questions around, you know, financial projections, anything that's forward looking, or use of proceeds. So if you have a question around any of those, please visit the Start Engine Raise page. I dropped the link in the chat box. Um, go ahead, check it out. All that information is there for you. So yeah, um, seeing questions coming in. First question here is, could you explain how Key West trading is positioned within the spirits uh, market? Oh, that, that's a great question. So uh, our positioning, you know, um, Absinthe is a brand new category of, of, of uh, spirits in the United States. And that's kind of what we're, we're kind of doubling down on right now, as I explained a little bit earlier. 
uh, it's not a crowded space. There's no huge players in there. Uh, Spirits of St. George, I think, out in California, is, is they're the ones that kind of pioneered the way for absinthe getting it legalized back in 2007. And they, they spend a lot of time on gins and other things like that as well. So that's another reason for being kind of in the position we are to want to launch out in front is because eventually Diageo and Bacardi brands and all these other guys are going to start, you know, putting out their, their absinthe products. So we want to make sure that we, you know, are out in front of all of that. And right now we are. It takes a long time and a lot of money to get a recipe approved through the government, uh, especially for absinthe, which is such a diff the most difficult spirit. Uh, I would venture to say is, uh, and it's also so new and was illegal for 95 years. So I would say from a positioning standpoint, we're in an absolutely fantastic position to jump out way in front of, you know, all, all competition. And then uh, it, even when, we, and then as the bigger companies get involved into that particular spirits category, all that's going to do is legitimize our, our position and our standing in the marketplace. And then what are some KPIs that investors should monitor to gauge the company's success? Yeah, yeah. So the uh, indicators, like I, I think I mentioned a little earlier, is, is distribution. So now we're just focused on getting the products out, getting them launched, all the hard parts done, all the back end part of it's done. Now it's just moving product, you know, distribution. So now we're now we're doubling down and focused on that. I've literally stayed away from distribution and done everything ourselves in-house up to this point because we weren't scaled properly to be able to handle expanded distribution. Because as soon as you pick up a distributor, they're like, hey, send me four pallets of this and three pallets of that, two pallets of this. And oh, by the way, uh, you know, carry the cost for that for 180 days. You know, those kind of things. So and we weren't in that position. Now we are. Now we're ready to take on the distribution and we can handle it, service it properly. And obviously, you know, uh, as the as the funds come in and the raise comes in and as we uh, raise more money, we just get bigger and better, bigger and bigger and, you know, better at that. And it's just at that point, it's just a numbers game. So then it's just, you know, how many pallets, where we're shipping it to. And then we can, then we can still idle and throttle, you know, that as we go. So instead of going, we're just going to be nationwide and be all over the place and not be able to handle it. We're strategically, you know, Miami, Fort Lauderdale, New Orleans, you know, Tennessee, you know, we're, so we're, we're picking those, those markets and launching properly. And now we're getting all of the, the vehicles in place, uh, like liquor split, people like that. So one good thing about distribution is that we don't have to just keep building buildings and hiring more people and doing all that kind of stuff to do the distribution. The distributors are already there. They're just taking on our brands and putting it in their portfolio. And then will there be room down the line for a nautical type moonshine in the product line? Also, will there be a tequila? Uh, yes, we are working. I've had a ton of questions about tequila. Uh, you know, that's the one thing I was going to kind of, I wouldn't say save for last, but save for later, is that, you know, with us for product development and things like that, I've been spending all the time developing the absence and the botanical-based spirits, which the gin is botanical-based spirit. So, um, you know, the tequila thing, we are kind of also monitoring that, you know, mezcal versus tequila versus, you know, pure agave. There's a bunch of different ways to go with that. And we want to make sure that when we get that tequila out, that it'll be a good quality product and not just any old tequila, right? We've got to put some sort of spin on it or do something weird no one's ever done before. <laughs> or, you know, you know, there's going to be, I've got to have some sort of twist that we do to it so that we're not just another pretty face in the crowd, you know, kind of thing. So yes, on that, uh, the nautical moonshine, that, that's an interesting one there as far as that goes. And uh, I don't know, um, a buddy of mine owns nautical American gin out of Boston. And basically they just took a gin and, and put um, uh, some sea salt and some other, you know, kind of herbs and things into it to give it that sea flavor or sea taste. Definitely something we can do with, with a, a moonshine. Keep in mind that moonshine is just unaged whiskey. So, uh, and then at what proof do you want it? Typically a moonshine is going to be right off the still, you know, you know, 180, 190 proof, almost a pure grain alcohol. So a lot of the moonshines that are out on the market, they're called moonshine or just watered down, you know, to like a 90, 90 or 96 proof. So, you know, it's another, another question you ask yourself as a company is, do we do a real moonshine at 180 or 190, you know, cask strength, you know, type of a type of, type of a proof, or do we, you know, water it down to 90 proof and make it easier to drink? So that, that's always been kind of a thing from a moonshine standpoint, if I've, you know, I've got my roots in that, you know, so we're not allowed to pollute it. <laughs> and then my family comes from we never made flavored moonshine so one thing about our family was we, we made one recipe 
It was a non-flavored moonshine, and it was made the same way every time since 1883. No change whatsoever. Couldn't monkey with it. Couldn't change it. Couldn't change the mash bill. You make it one way and only one way. That's how our family was so well known in the region for that was the Martin shine. And it had a, a like a, we call it the McDonald's effect. No matter where you got it, it tastes exactly the same and you know what you're going to get. So there's, so those are kind of the questions we're going to be asking ourselves moving forward. Um, but, just, but at the end of the day, you can know if we launch the product, it's going to be the highest quality. And then what are the growth opportunities and challenges specific to the absent market? Uh, well, you know, there is a bit of an education that goes along with it. We have, we have the advantage that, um, you know, it now it's becoming a lot more widespread. Whenever I was going to launch the absinthe in Key West, I went around to all of our retailers that we already had, 70 plus retailers in Key West at the time, and I couldn't find a single bottle of absinthe anywhere on the island, and nobody even knew, you know, half the time what you were talking about. Uh, so, now we went from that to being on menus all over town and you can go to General Horseplay. If you're familiar with Key West at all, these names will make sense to you. General Horseplay has all of our products there, are absinthe products and full service. And you can do the absinthe fountain service there. Uh, we've got our root of all evil uh, in several different menus, uh, which is the absinthe and old fashioned root beer. Uh, we're even on the menu at uh, Blue Heaven. You know, so they like these mainstream places, you know, that you would think you're never going to have a you know recipe there. We've got we're on the menu at uh, Hot Tin Roof, you know, at Ocean Key Resort. Uh, we're at Little Palm Island, which is uh, kind of well known as like the the fanciest uh, resort in the entire Florida Keys. All the celebrities go and stay there, and we have an actual proper absinthe service there, where you can buy the the Hemingway Champagne, which is thirty five hundred dollars a bottle, and do a, an actual death in the afternoon, <laughs> which is kind of unaffordable for most people. So, so that's that's the kind of thing, you know, is that the um, as soon as we get some of these bigger players that even come to the absinthe market, it's just going to, it's just going to, you know, pour concrete on it, and solidify it. So we're super happy with our positioning and, and uh, what our growth potential is for sure. And then can you provide details on the company's production capacity and plans for scaling up uh, operation? Yeah. So scalability, that was another issue, obviously that all distilleries and all craft, you know, makers, you know, faces, what is the scalability? Um, so we have pretty much an unlimited ability to scale at this point. So our partners that we're working with, uh, so we, uh, it's, we own the recipes and then we have the recipes produced for us by large scale producers. So Green River Distilling, for example, is one of our partners in my hometown in Owensboro, Kentucky, uh, one of the oldest DSPs in the country. Uh, so they make products for us. Uh, there's over a million barrels in the Rick house. There's unlimited, you know, kind of scalability as far as that goes. It's just how much money do you want to spend? So, um, you know, uh, there after COVID, we ran into problems getting bottles and ink to make labels and all kinds of crazy stuff uh, because there was a Chinese glass shortage you know, and all kinds of stuff. So finally, we're at a point now where all that's been resolved. We can buy all the bottles we want, all the corks we want, print all the labels we want and make an unlimited capacity of, of, of spirits. So yeah, zero, zero issues as far as scalability. And then how does the company approach pricing strategy and maintain profitability in the competitive market? Yeah, so uh, just to give you a little bit of uh, example on like the, the death in the afternoon or any of the absinthe products themselves and return on investment and kind of like, uh, imagine if I'm pitching the bar. So an absinthe drink uh, uses only less than an ounce of absinthe to make a drink, 0.9 ounces. It's 140 proof. So as the bar owner, um, there's no reason or advantage for your bartender to over pour the drink for his friend that comes in the bar. So you pretty much get 100% uh, profit off of your bottle. You get all of there. There's no over pouring of this. So this one bottle that we sell for uh, $58 retail and it retail or $58 wholesale and then it retails for $80 in the store. Um, it sells for 20 to $25 a drink in the bar. So an average uh, bar can make $600 off of the product. So it's a pretty, pretty good return with almost no waste and no what we call giveaways or whatever. There's no reason to give it away. Um, and then for us, um, this is uh, you know, an excellent return you know, uh, on investment for us, and especially the more we scale. And then what is the long-term projection of availability of wormwood? Uh, it's unlimited. It's a weed. <laughs> so, 
and and we're at some point uh, kind of left this out because it's more of a longer range plan is that we're eventually going to buy farmland here up in florida and and grow our own wormwood but literally if you just plant one of them they just take off and it's a weed like mint or something like that and just it just it grows uh <laughs> it's, it gets out of control actually jim i'm not seeing any more questions coming in but you know what would you say are the top three reasons someone should invest into key west well you know we're uh one the one thing i would say uh right off the bat just from an investment standpoint uh is that you can be personally involved in our journey you know uh obviously you can go out and buy microsoft stock or or uh you know tesla or something like that or whatever and you're putting money in getting a certain return on that money with us small company boots on the ground delivering liquor on a scooter you know you're investing in uh, the personal story and the personal journey so not only are you going to you know hopefully get a good return on your investment down the road uh when we are acquired at some point uh but you get to follow along with us and enjoy the ride and have a piece of it you know so i'd say that that's uh you know the the top reason the second reason is you know hopefully if we play this out and do it right it's a it's a exponential return on investment you know um given how all things work out and this is a, a i want everybody to know too in the spirits industry we're what's called an ankle biter so we're a small brand the big corporate conglomerates the diageos of the world and stuff like that they let us grow to a certain point and then they come in and they buy that company up and either bring it into their portfolio or if it's just annoying they just they just get rid of the brand altogether and then you cash out and go go down down the way with it so ultimately what happens is is we build the brands we build the story we build the market share we do all blaze the trail and then a big company can come in and then inject it with cash and and take it to you know the the exponential levels past that <clears throat> and then i say beyond that you know it's just uh um you know it, it's fun you know at the when i got into when I got out of spirits, when we were doing it illegally and then did, did other things and then I got back into it, uh, one promise that I made to myself was that I'm going to have fun with it. It's not going to be a job. Uh, we thoroughly love what we do. Uh, we I love getting up in the morning and doing this stuff. I do it seven days a week and I'm always working. I've, I've been an entrepreneur my entire life. I've never had a job. I'm 52 years old and I've been self-employed my entire life. And um I, I just thoroughly enjoy it. So I think that's that's the thing too, is like, this is just a fun, enjoyable thing that we can make money on. Awesome. Well, thank you, Jim, so much for taking the time out of your day to okay. talk to us here. And thank you everyone who attended the webinar. And if you know you wanted to relive this webinar, we were going to be posting the replay on, on Start Engine. So be on the lookout for that. Uh, Jim, anything else? Nope. Thank you guys very much. We really appreciate you. And uh, like I say, any questions at all, don't feel, don't uh, hesitate to reach out and, and uh, we'll guide you along the way. Have a good one. Thank uh, you guys.